I've explored some of the wildest places on Earth. But my favourite is still Britain. In this series, I'm going to travel from dawn till dusk, carving six individual trails through spectacular, diverse landscapes in order to explore each unique habitat and the incredible wildlife that exists there. I'll journey along rivers, navigate my way through forests and across mountains in search of some of our greatest national treasures. <laughs> This week, I'm in Wales' largest and highest national park, Snowdonia. The great peaks of this mountainous region once matched those of the Himalayas, before millions of years of wind, rain and ice wore them down to the more accessible human scale we see today. I will be discovering how in this rugged, challenging landscape, there are forms of wildlife which survive against all the odds and can only be found in this very special part of Britain. I will be travelling through Wales's most spectacular upland terrain as I make my way to mighty Mount Snowdon. But I'm starting my journey in the south of Snowdonia, out on the untamed moorland of the Rhenogith Mountains. This is really great country. This is one of the wilder parts of the National Park. It's a place where you have to be able to take care of yourself. I'm joining wildlife warden Paul Williams in search of an animal that has flourished in this uncompromising terrain. An animal many people would be surprised to find at large in the British countryside the feral goat. Goats have roamed these hillsides for more than 10,000 years. Nowadays, about 400 are scattered across the Hrinogith. That one at the front is fantastic horns, amazing. Yes. yes. Are these mostly males? It looks to me like they are all males, yes, yeah. You can see the horns sweep back and outward yes. a little bit, yeah. whereas the horns of, an, of a nanny are straighter. They're very impressive, aren't they? Oh, the big billies can be spectacular animals. There's no doubt about that. So how did the goats come to be here? They were domesticated animals. They were farmed for their meat, for the milk, um, for their hides, and when they became a less popular domestic animal, probably the middle of the 18th century. They were either released or just left to get on with it on their own, and now they live a life as if they were wild. I like the way they move when they bound up the rocks. I think it was fantastic. Yeah. But they suit this landscape so well. These incomers have adapted to Snowdonia so successfully that their numbers have to be carefully managed but I think, after all these years, they have earned their place in this landscape. It's now time for me to leave behind the High Moors and follow the river Gamlan down into the oak woodlands of Coed Ganhwyd. One of the things I really love about Wales are the rivers that flow off of the mountains down into the forest, like here. The sound is full of life, and this moist, damp, humid environment is the perfect breeding place for mosses. Sam Bosenkett has studied the stunning plant life in this wood. He introduces me to his prized specimen. Well, the, the speciality of this woodland, because it has 95% of the British population of this species, is this thing here which is called prostrate signal moss. Not the most spectacular of mosses. But it does feel like velvet, it's lovely. It does, and it's got lots of little tiny spore capsules just starting. So it should be able to spread all over the place. And yet, bizarrely, this ravine is the only place where this moss can thrive in Britain. 
In fact, this moss is more at home thousands of miles south of here in the Canary Islands. So why is it doing so well in this river valley in North Wales? The key thing here is the water. And there's a whole series of cascades down the river. Each one of those churns up and kicks up a great plume of mist. And you can actually feel it on us here to a certain I can, extent. I can definitely feel it. It's moist here. And I can see it's going, what, 20 feet or more into the air? Yes, looking almost like smoke yeah. drifting up there. And so all the rocks here are kept permanently humid, warmer and frost-free in the winter. So it's like a giant greenhouse? It is. And if you go into a tropical house, that's exactly what you get, these mists being created. And, of course, the tree canopy is helping to keep that mist in as well, as are the rock walls on either side of the river. So that precise mix of humidity, warmth, all that sort of thing just comes, comes together right here. My next stop is also in the Welsh woodlands and a colony of honeybees doing well, despite the catastrophic worldwide drop in bee numbers. Clive Hudson has kept hives for more than 30 years, but recently he has become fascinated by the activities of honeybees living in the wild. So that's the bees nest there in that hole? It is, that's right. I think I can see the comb, can I? Goodness me, look at that. that. I can't believe that's so exposed. It is unusual for a bee tree, and that the comb is virtually open to the air. And in mm. this hive, how many bees would you estimate? 40, should we go for about 40,000? 40,000? About 40,000. It's still, still building, maybe going up to 40, 50,000. Should we go and have a close look? Yeah, OK. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. You can feel the warmth coming out from inside, can't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm really surprised that they aren't better protected. Surely they're a risk for woodpeckers. Well, a little piece of the comb that's broken off recently, whether it came off with the wind or whether it's been attacked by a bird, I'm not sure. Fascinating. And you can see you know, all the pollen sacs heavily laden, aren't they? It's, it's a light greeny yellow, which is the protein to feed the larvae. And uh, the, these workers actually packing the food in there. They're such hard workers. The honeybee is our most important pollinator. So it's a major concern that the UK population has almost halved since the invasion of the varroa mite two decades ago. But this colony and many others in North Wales now appear to be doing well without any chemical protection against this deadly parasite. A lot of beekeepers are no longer treating chemically for the varroa mite and maybe hard to believe, but the people who are not treating are having fewer losses. That's really so interesting. Somehow or other, we're hopeful the bees are coping and I think there's a very good chance they're going to be all right. It's fantastic, isn't it, the way nature works? The valley woodlands of Snowdonia are rich with rare and important wildlife, but most visitors are drawn to the jagged, wind-battered peaks to the north. And that's where I'm heading next. This is Coombe Idwal. A lot of people come here to, to walk. It's very beautiful. In fact, one of my great heroes came here too, Charles Darwin. Not a lot of people realise that Darwin was actually a very gifted geologist, and he's credited with being the first person to realise that this lake was formed by glacial action. And these boulders here that were left by a retreating glacier are named after him. These are Darwin's rocks. While this landscape is the product of immense geological forces, 
Farming has also played a big part in the evolution of Snowdonia's countryside. Livestock graze the hillsides, clearing away trees and other vegetation. So how does the wildlife fare in the habitat that's left behind? I've organised an overnight survey of the animal activity on a mountain farm. What interests me is this grass. You can see how tightly grazed that is. So how rich is this in mammal life? This evening, we've put out some small mammal traps to see if we can catch any alive. And in the morning, we'll see whether we've had any luck. I'm travelling through the dramatic landscapes and unique habitats of North Wales on a journey to Snowdon, the country's highest peak. I'm here to find out about the natural life of this beautiful part of the world, and that includes the heavily grazed agricultural land that covers much of the National Park. Last night, I asked Pete Kay of the Field Study Centre to lay a series of small mammal traps on a Snowdonia mountain farm. Our catch will reveal how wildlife is faring. <laughs> first trap. Well, gonna... the, the door's closed. Oh, the first one. Excellent. So, so you insulated that because it was a cold night last night, wasn't it? It was a cold it? night, yeah. So, yeah, a bit of bubble wrap. Shall we see? Yeah, let's have a look. Give it a tug. <laughs> Little wood, wood mouse, isn't it? Fantastic, look at that. And of course, this is a really dangerous time for a, for a wood mouse to be out in the dark because everything's feeding young. Yeah, and they've got to go out and feed their own young. Yes. They're just starting the first generation of the year. Apparently, they leave out, you know, if it's a distinctive twig or a leaf, then they can mark their trails so they can navigate so and lead them give, astray. Give way sign. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is what happens with the mice. Yep. You're going to find your way back home. Gone. I'm afraid. One trap. Brilliant. First one. Good. And there's another door closed here. Let's see what we've got in this one. Yeah. Here we go. Another wood mouse. It soon becomes obvious that this is exceptionally fertile territory for small mammals. Is it another wood mouse? It is. <laughs> it's a wall of wood mice. In the space of just 20 metres, we find four wood mice. These rodents are very common. In Britain, they outnumber humans by two to one, but it's still a surprise to find so many in such a small area. We're going to try and pop it into this fish tank. You have to be quick with that. I know. Yeah. So I, fast. I am ready. <laughs> there we go. No, you're safe. I like to talk to animals in moments like this. I know it sounds strange, but I find it seems to calm them. Rodents, in their tracks, they show four toes in the front feet and five in the rear. Yeah. You can see that really clearly here. It's beautiful. Now, it's so easy to forget that ecosystems are built on the backs of tiny things. And of course, upon the rodents, there are predators preying, so that they're the ground swell of the ecosystem. Although it's a pretty unenviable position to be <laughs> you know, a major prey species. Yeah. There it goes. Oh, it's going straight back. That was so interesting this morning. Putting those traps out has completely transformed my understanding of this, this landscape. I would never have thought there could be so many small mammals in ground that's so heavily grazed. It makes you think again, and that's the beauty of that kind of research. My next destination is a steep-sided glacial valley near Mount Snowdon. I've been asked not to identify the exact spot because I'm on the lookout for a rare bird, the chuff. There are only about 300 breeding pairs of this red-billed crow left in Britain, and there are just 15 at inland sites in Snowdonia, a drop of nearly half in the last 20 years. So the locations of their nests are fiercely protected. Adrian Stafford monitors the Snowdonia population of this charismatic bird. It can be a challenge. Today, Adrienne is checking a nest perched above the shaft of an abandoned mine. There's three chicks. In you go. This is her only chance to weigh, measure, and ring these young birds. Adrienne. Here we are. Yes. Oh, look at that. 
you've got the three little chaps. They're behaving themselves, they're very young, aren't they? <laughs> we think they're about just over a fortnight. <laughs> we don't want you to wriggle, little chap. So they're just passing their reptilian stage. Yep. And we just take three quick measurements and we're going to put metal BTO ring with the unique number on it. Yep. But combined with that, there's three colour rings as well, so that you don't have to catch the you can, bird or, you can or read find them from it a dead. Distance, yeah. We can, if we see the colours, we'll know exactly who they are from a distance. You hear the adult pair yeah. in the background. Yeah. Yeah. They're keeping an eye they're on us. Keeping an eye, but they're not too disturbed. I was quite surprised by that. They quite often shout when you're approaching, but most of these birds breed for quite a number of years, so a lot of them will have seen this quite a few times before. before. Thank you. Time to go home. We leave the nest in peace so that the adult chuffs can return and check their young. So, Adrian, that's the ringing done. Yes. But you've been doing this for a very long while, haven't you? I must have got hooked on chuffs pretty early along. Um, I think by about 1995, 96, most of my time off would be out with my telescope trying to find out where our marked birds were and who was paired with whom and where they were and you know, even divorces, and I know a lot of these chuffs almost personally, you could say. Um, so you feel personally bereft when, when you lose one of the ones that you've been watching for, you know, a dozen years or more. I'm starting on the final leg of my journey towards Snowdonia's crowning glory. But as I travel through this landscape, it's impossible to ignore the many reminders of this region's industrial past. In Victorian times, 17,000 men produced up to half a million tonnes of slate a year from places like the Denorwig Quarry in the Hamberis Valley. Now, this site really is testimony to the hard work of the Welsh slate miners. Look at that. This was, when it was working, the second largest slate mine in the world. I think today, is a hideous eyesore. But from nature's perspective, it's just a changed habitat. And already she's creeping into the cracks and crevices and reclaiming this land. But there's a great view from up here. That is Mount Snowdon, the tallest mountain in Wales that gives its name to the National Park. Growing on the slopes of that mountain is a very rare plant indeed. There are just a handful of them, and they're very tiny. It's a plant I've never seen before, and I'm very excited at the prospect of searching for it. The only problem is there's a forecast for bad weather coming in. So wish me luck. The Snowdon lily has clung precariously to the cliff face of the mountain since the retreat of the ice 10,000 years ago. One of Britain's most endangered plants, it hides away in the Welsh mist, existing in only five locations in the UK, all within a few miles of Mount Snowdon. Howell Roberts is responsible for the conservation of this precious plant, but even he took two years to track down a specimen on this remote cliff face. Now he has agreed to share his secret with me. So how, what rock conditions are we looking for to find these plants? For most of the Arctic alpine plants, we're looking for a rock that's slightly less acidic than the majority of the rock in the upland. The minute you see that type of rock, north and northeast facing, high up, you've got the right conditions for the Arctic alpine plants. So, so how do you tell where the rock is less acidic? Is there, are there any things to look for? Well, just, just look at that face there. There's hardly any vegetation on it. Yep. Then just look across into that corner, we're starting to get some plants. Plants yes. of interest. You can see rose root. Rose root, there. isn't it? Yes, I can see that. So it is really specific, tiny little pockets that you're looking for. Very small pockets. And for some of the plants, including Snowden lilies, we're looking for not even in pockets, but in crevices in the rock face. Wow. We make our way up a scree slope, hunting along the sheer rock face for traces of this tiny alpine treasure. Let's see. Ah, I've seen some plants. Uh, rose root, yes, yeah, but yeah. look what's immediately adjacent to it. That's Lloydius rotina. That's the plant that we're looking for. <laughs> Amazing. But look at it, how 
how delicate it is. Because uh, most people would just think it was a piece of grass. Indeed, that, that, that's perhaps the saving grace for it, for many, many people who come here to look for it. They fail to see that. No. Now, you've got to look very carefully now as we go on, because I hope there are a few flower buds and perhaps a flower ahead of us. So keep your eyes well peeled. Uh, ah, there is one with a flower. <laughs> I love the excitement we're, in your voice. Very, very fortunate. As a man with passion. That is Lloydia Sarotina. That's the, the gem that we're looking for. The Snowden lily. Snowden lily. Beautiful. I mean, it's amazing because it looks like it's growing straight out of the rock. Oh, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's very beautiful. With my journey complete, I settle on a narrow mountain ledge for a well-earned brew as the mist slowly clears to reveal a stunning Snowden view. Well, I've really enjoyed coming to Snowdon. It's been a privilege to come up and see that little jewel that is to be found on the mountain here. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, because you've described it to a T there by saying it's a jewel, and it's a jewel in the crown of Snowdonia. Next time, I'm heading to Dumfries and Galloway to find out about the stunning wildlife of the beautiful coastline. Long may it continue and the contrasting habitats of the vast conifer forests. See those young like that, what a privilege. And the spectacular landscapes of Scotland's southern uplands. Well, a blaze in 1666 changed the face of London forever, but the Great Fire brings a political problem for the King, Thursday at 9. Here on ITV Next this evening, though, Barnaby's struggling to find a motive for a crime when someone is out wreaking havoc in a village in Midsummer Murders.